Quebec City, Quebec, Canada, May 5, 2012. My name is Laura Kinney, I thought to myself as I watched my adamantium-coated claws slide out between the knuckles of my fisted hands. Memories came to me unbidden, of me sitting in the featureless cell I had been raised in, watching these same claws coming out of much smaller hands. It was just like my new father said in the movies, it hurt every time, but it was a familiar pain. No matter how many times I went, snicked, my body healed itself the moment I retracted these claws, the flesh knitting back together, the nerves reconnecting. Sighing, I dropped my hands down onto my thighs, doing my best to ignore the dull ache of the now cold metal inside my forearms. With my enhanced metabolism they would warm up soon enough, and it wasn't like I would ever have to worry about frostbite. It had taken me almost an entire day to make my way down to Quebec City after I left my mother behind at the facility to watch over the rest of my new family, and I had taken that time to sort through my new memories as I listened to the comforting roar of the motorcycle sitting beneath me. Years of training, of torture, and most recently of killing. I was still young yet, and they facility hadn't sent me on many missions yet, but every single death I had caused before waking up was just as fresh in my memory as if I had just walked away from their cooling body. Having a photographic memory was apparently a side effect of my new body. Probably caused by the healing factor I had inherited, which was supposedly even better than dear old Papa Logan's. In the comics, Laura had been able to knit her own memories back together after having her brain smashed before. I had stopped my motorcycle at the top of a hill looking over Quebec City, enjoying the fact that I had driven far enough south that I was no longer surrounded by snow, and sat there watching as massive commercial airliners came and went from the nearby airport. I would be on one of those planes soon enough, but there were a few things I desperately needed to take care of in the city before I was ready. After all, you can't march an army on an empty stomach. Gurgle. Yeah, yeah, I heard ya, I grumbled down at my empty tummy. Taking off my filter mask, I carefully sniffed myself to make sure that I didn't have any of the trigger scent lingering on my clothes from where I had hugged my mother earlier, only to find the barest of traces with my enhanced senses. I placed the filter mask into one of the leather saddlebags hanging on the sides of the rear fender, before checking to make sure that the bike was in neutral, and pressing the ignition button to start the engine. It took less than half an hour to get into the city proper, and from there I followed my nose to a medium-sized coffee shop that advertised free Wi-Fi, and computers available for rent. Pulling up into a parking spot next to a fancy-looking racing bike, I killed my engine and dropped the kickstand, before locking my handlebars. A small speaker made a high-pitched ding when I walked through the door, causing the barista behind the counter to greet me in French, which was thankfully one of the many languages that I had been trained in during my most recent childhood. I returned her greeting in the same language, taking a brief moment to give the interior of the cyber cafe a casual inspection that was anything but casual, noting all of the exits, dangers, and potential blind spots, in less time than it would take a normal person to blink. Assured that nobody had recognized me, and that I wasn't about to be ambushed, I walked up to the counter and calmly ordered a large drip coffee, and one of their breakfast sandwiches, again in fluid French with a Quebecois accent. As the young woman was ringing me up, I also requested an hour of time on one of their computers, paying the woman with some of the brightly colored money I had looted from the guards and scientists I had killed back at the facility that morning. I took a moment to think about all of the people I had killed there, while the barista heated up my sandwich, and the tall paper cup slowly filled up with coffee. My actions would have horrified me in my past life, but after having lived 14 years as X-23, all I could feel was relief that I no longer had to worry about being used by them ever again. The temporary access code to your computer is printed on the receipt, the barista informed me, handing it over with my wrapped sandwich and coffee cup. If you need more time on the computer, just let one us know so we can ring you up. I thanked her before making my way over to one of the computers that sat in a secluded corner of the coffee shop, where I could have a clear view of the door without having to look away from the monitor. 
I was just sitting down in the uncomfortable plastic backed chair when I noticed the front cover of the newspaper one of the other patrons was reading. The headline read Battle of New York above a full color picture of a Shatori Leviathan crashing on top of a large building. Looking up at the top corner of the paper I finally found out was today's date was. May 5, 2012, one day after the Avengers had fought off a full-blown alien invasion that culminated in Iron Man having to force a missile into the cliched portal in the sky when the idiots in charge decided to nuke the city. Well, I'd better let mom know that Natasha is going to be a bit busy for a few days, I thought to myself as I sat down at the computer and logged in with the code provided in my receipt. That might actually be for the best, come to think of it, since that will give me a bit of time to get out of the area before I pop up on S.H.I.E.L.D.'s radar. Taking a scalding mouthful of hot coffee, and enjoying my healing factor as my taste buds quickly regenerated, I spent a few moments poking around the internet before deciding to sign up for an email address. Amazingly enough, Google was actually a thing in my new dimension, and it only took me a few minutes to set up a new Gmail account. 2. Sarah Kinney From, Laura Kinney Subject, Hi Mom Hi Mom I just wanted to let you know that I got to the city safe and sound. I'm getting a quick bite to eat before heading out for some shopping, and I plan to get myself a room for the night before moving on. So, slight change of plans, apparently the woman I asked you to contact will be busy for the next couple of days, since she was in New York yesterday. If you can, I'd suggest waiting a week before giving her a call. Any word on my sisters? Pressing send, I opened a new browser window and started going through the different news sites to see what was being said about yesterday's attack. Opinions were divided, with a majority of people calling the Avengers heroes for their actions the day before, while an angry minority blamed them and people like them for causing the attack in the first place. The only thing everyone seemed to be agreeing on was that launching a nuke at the city was kind of a dick move. A fame had come through with her end of the bargain, and I had woken up in the Marvel Cinematic Universe early enough to make enough of a change to hopefully prevent Thanos from being able to snap his gauntlet fingers and kill half of everyone everywhere. Oh, and not only gather what information and resources I could to help prevent the Reapers from curb stomping the Mass Effect Universe, but also figure out a way to get myself there as well. You know, no pressure. Luckily, I already had a few plans in place even before a Thame sent my soul on to get reborn as X-23. I would have to be careful to limit any major changes this early in the game, if I wanted to have enough predictability to carry through my plans in the future. Placing my new family in the lap of Natasha Romanoff was a large risk, but if anyone could help my sisters out it would be the Black Widow. I'd have to play it a bit by ear but all of the espionage training I had been given would help in that regard. Making use of my new photographic memory, I went through the MCU timeline in my head, making and discarding several ideas while idly doing a Google map search of the stores in the local area. The events of Iron Man 3 would be happening around the end of this year, but I knew better than to try to get anywhere near an enhancement as volatile as Extremis. I already had an awesome healing factor, without all of those potentially deadly side effects. The convergence would be happening at the end of 2013, but again I didn't want anything to do with the ether, so I could easily skip out on anything to do with the events in Thor, the Dark World. On the other hand, I would need to be ready to protect my family against Hydra when we get to the events in Winter Soldier at the beginning of 2014. There was nothing that those bastards would like more than to get a hold of my mother and sisters, in order to add to their own super soldier program. Unfortunately, the oldest my new sisters would only be 13 at that point. Old enough to be counted as a potential asset, but not old enough to defend the rest of my family against a concentrated attack. That gave me about a year and a half to prepare myself before reuniting with my family, time which I would have to use wisely. But a little bit of extra-dimensional pre-knowledge can go a long way, I thought to myself with a grin. And there is an amazing amount of knowledge to be found in this world, if you know where to look. 
Having found what I needed in Google Maps, I glanced at the clock to see that I had already spent half of the hour of computer time I had paid for. Stuffing the crumpled sleeve my sandwich had come in down into my empty coffee cup, I closed the map I had been looking at and opened up a travel website to check what flights would be able to take me towards my next destination. My search was interrupted when I noticed a notification pop up in the other browser window, and I switched back over to it to see that my mother had responded to my earlier email. To, Laura Kinney. From, Sarah Kinney. Subject, Re, Hi Mom. Hi, Laura. I took three showers, and got a change of clothes, before waking your sisters up. They are all a bit disoriented at the moment, as they had been in the middle of getting programmed with memories that had been copied from your own brain by the other scientists. Thankfully, none of the obedience programming had been done yet, and they recognized me from your own memories. They're helping me clean up around here while I go through the files left behind on this computer. Once I got your email I did check out the news sites. It looks like they had a busy day yesterday, so I figure I'll give about a week before contacting the woman you suggested. I have a record of all of the expected response codes in case anyone tries to contact the facility here, so we should be safe enough for the time being. I'm glad to hear you're having a good time. Stay out of trouble, and email me whenever you get the chance, okay? Love ya. Mom. I blinked a few tears out of my eyes as I got done reading her email, and used a napkin to clean my face before I made a mess of myself. It was a good thing that the memories of my past life hadn't been returned to me until the last minute, since it could have been disastrous if my sisters had my pre-knowledge as well. Thankfully, the memories they did get from me would help keep them safe, and help them connect with our mother. Receiving a notification that I had less than 60 seconds before my time ran out and I was logged out of the system, I took that time to log out of my email and clear out the browser history, cache, and cookies. Closing the final browser window, I stood up and made my way towards the door, dropping my garbage off in the trash can on my way out. Hopping on my motorcycle, I made my way towards the first of several local thrift shops in search of affordable clothing that wouldn't make me stand out. Wearing used clothing wasn't glamorous, but it would allow me to blend in better than I could with an entirely new wardrobe, and allow me to stretch out my limited funds. Ignoring the overwhelming scent of cheap laundry detergent, and the oily artificial butter from the popcorn machine behind the front counter, I made my way through the store one aisle at a time. I had never bought my own clothes before in this new life, as everything I had worn had been given to me by the facility, but it didn't take long to guess my approximate size by holding a few shirts and pants in front of my body. Grabbing a few of each, I made my way to the small changing rooms in the back and tried a few of them on before finding a shirt and pant size that would fit me. I ended up putting most of the clothes back on the rack, before finding several tank tops, a couple of plaid flannel shirts, and some black dress style pants that looked like they had come from Mook Surplus. Paying for my small selection, I moved on to the next thrift shop to widen my selection, lucking out when I found a beat-up brown leather backpack that was in a lot better shape than it looked. The next thrift shop had a pair of knee-high leather combat boots with laces up the front and zippers up the sides that I couldn't leave without. Not wanting to leave my things out on the bike where they might get stolen, I packed the clothes into my new backpack and stopped by a local motel. Renting a room and dropping the bag off, I then made my way to a nearby department store to buy those items of clothing that you never want to get secondhand. Thankfully, the woman working in the women's underwear section was more than willing to help me find my sizes and steer me towards the brands that were better quality, without breaking the bank. Grabbing several sports bras, and some boy shorts, I stopped by the dressing room to make sure that they would be a comfortable fit before buying them with my dwindling money supply. I had just got done stripping myself naked for the first time to try on the new underwear when I froze, having caught my reflection out of the corner of my eye. I stood there for a moment, staring into my own emerald green eyes, before slowly lowering my gaze down to my body, tracing my eyes over the pale skin that disguised my densely packed muscles. Okay, new rule, 
I muttered to myself as I tried on a pair of black boy shorts. No perving on myself until after my 18th birthday. The first pair of underwear didn't quite fit right, being a bit too tight, but the next pair were comfortable enough. I would have to grab a few in this size, and a few the next size up so that I had them on hand when I outgrew these ones. After all, I didn't know how long it would be before I would have another chance to go clothes shopping. I quickly dressed myself in the clothes I had woken up in and returned the wrong sized underwear to their racks before grabbing several more of the right sizes and loading them up in the shopping cart. I thanked the woman that had helped me and started hunting down the rest of the items on my mental list. A thermos and several water cleaner tabs were added to the cart from the camping section, along with a filter straw in case I need to drink from a stream or something. A small package of laundry soap was tossed in so that I could clean my new clothes. A container of women's multivitamins and a small packet of pads were added from the pharmacy and cosmetics section. And, last but not least, I grabbed a few boxes of cheap high-protein bars and some beef jerky so that I would have something to eat during the first part of my travels. My mental math had been spot on, and I only had a few dollars left by the time I was done getting checked out. It then took a liberal use of my hard-earned Tetris skills to get everything packed into the two saddlebags on my motorcycle. The assorted tags, packing, and clothes hangers ended up making their way into the trash can by the cart return before everything was finally able to fit. I drove back to my room to gather up my backpack, and took everything to a nearby laundromat. Exchanging the remaining paper bills for coins I could use in their laundry machines, I sorted out my clothes, thankful for the fact that everything I had bought had been dark shades and machine washable. I had to wash my clothes twice with soap, and once with just water, before deeming them acceptable. Tossing them into one of the huge dryers, I fed the last of my coins into the machine, and sat down on an old beat-up wooden chair to watch the TV they had mounted on the nearby wall. They were playing scenes from yesterday's alien invasion, using footage taken by those brave news helicopters before they were shot down, spliced with video captures from CCTV cameras and cell phones, while one of the talking heads narrated in the background. It was strange, seeing the Shatori attack on TV, and knowing that it was no longer just a movie to me. After all, New York City was less than half a day's drive south from where I was sitting up here in Quebec City, and if the invasion hadn't been stopped there is no doubt could have already reached us here by this point. Tuning the television out once it switched to a segment on tax reforms, I went over the list of airline flights I had looked up earlier, plotting the best route to take to my destination. Even if I did have the money to pay for a ticket, there was no way I would be able to make it through airport security with the adamantium coating the claws in my forearms and feet, so the only option I had was to sneak onto the plane without getting caught. Thankfully, my photographic memory made it easy to remember flight times and tail numbers, and I had memorized the flights heading in the right direction for the next several days. Even if one of the flights got delayed, I would know what plane to look for next. Once my clothes were done drying, I took the time to inspect them for any new damage before carefully folding them up and stowing them in my beat-up leather backpack, arranging them around the rest of the meager supplies I had bought for myself today. From there, I made my way back to the room I had rented in the motel, and took a shower using the free soap and shampoo, doing my best to ignore the way the water going down the drain turned red when I washed some dried blood from my thick black hair. Once I was done with the shower, and dried off as best I could with the rough towels, I laid down in bed and practiced the meditation techniques that my first sensei had taught to me, allowing me to rest my mind and body, while still remaining aware of my surroundings. I roused myself from my meditation several hours later once the sun had set, and began to get ready for the next leg of my journey. I brushed my now dry hair out with my fingers as best I could, before putting it up into a tight braid, and tying it off with a length of leather bootlace from my old boots. Dressing myself in a set of new clothes I had left unpacked, I put on a pair of clean boy shorts and a sports bra, a black tank top, a pair of my black de pants, and some nice thick wool hiking socks. 
My new knee-high combat boots fit perfectly, and I resisted the urge to pop my foot claws, not wanting to ruin them too soon. I finally topped this all off with my bomber jacket, before covering the lower half of my face with the filter mask I had taken from the dead, the dead guard back at the facility. I double-checked the contents of my backpack, shuffling a few things around and placing a couple of sets of spare filters for my mask in one of the outside pouches. I then took the time to fill my thermos up with water from the shower head, since it wouldn't fit beneath the tap on the sink. Checking the time on the clock sitting on the end table, I threw my backpack onto my back and made my way out the door, stopping by the front counter to give them back the key to my room on my way out. The middle-aged man behind the counter gave me a nervous look when I walked in, eyeing the mask covering my lower face, and I felt his eyes on the back of my head as I made my way out to my motorcycle. There was still a small amount of traffic out on the roads even at this time of night, and his only grew steadier the closer I got to the airport. Instead of heading to the main gate, I drove out onto one of the side roads and parked my motorcycle in front of a closed store, turning it off but leaving the keys in the ignition. After all, I wasn't going to be able to take it with me, and it would spare the next would-be thief the hassle of having to hotwire it. The tall security fence that lined the edges of the airport runway were no match for the molecularly sharp edges of my adamantium claws, parting like butter when I ran a single claw down its length. Both sides of the cut seemed to blend back together once I was through to the other side, leaving no visible sign of the hole I had made for myself. Making my way towards the airport terminal, I made ample use of the relative darkness outside the direct illumination of the runway lights, tucking myself down into a small ball whenever an airliner passed by. In a relatively short amount of time I was down in the underbelly of the airport, where the maintenance men and baggage handlers worked hidden from the view of the passengers. Finding a baggage handler taking a nap behind one of the baggage trains, I carefully covered his mouth and placed him in a chokehold to ensure that he stayed unconscious, having little difficulty restraining him as he struggled in my grip. Once he had finally passed back out, I took his hard hat and reflective vest and started to rummage through his pockets. They had a relatively decent cell phone, though when I checked it, it showed that it was out of service, giving the option to search for a wireless connection in order to make a Wi-Fi call instead. Shrugging, I pulled the battery out of it, and placed it and the phone into one of the pockets on my jacket. Throwing the reflective vest over my leather jacket, and the hard hat over my braided hair, I continued to make my way through the underside of the airport in search of my flight. As luck would have it there were several monitors scattered around showing the arrivals and departures to help coordinate the people working down here, allowing me to locate the next flight heading down to Newark International. Once I had located my flight, I made my way over to the correct terminal, watching from the shadows as the baggage handler tossed the numerous suitcases, boxes, and bags onto the conveyor belt that fed into the underside of the plane. There was a small window of opportunity once the maintenance crew was finished, and the baggage was loaded, before the plane would taxi out to the airstrip for takeoff. I used that time to dart beneath the closest wing of the plane, hauling myself up the landing gear, and making my way across the small ledge there towards the main body of the plane. There was only one place where you can fit inside the wheel well of a Boeing 767 without getting crushed by the landing gear when it retracted, in a small section between the body of the plane and a section of metal framing towards the rear of the wheel well. My body was small enough to easily fit into that area, allowing me to sit down on a piece of cross brazing there, my overstuffed backpack hugged to my chest. Now. Allow me to point out that you should not try this yourself, due to the near 75% mortality rate of the recorded cases where people had attempted this before. You didn't have the benefit of a nice, pressurized, heated cabin when you were stowed down in the wheel well. Once the plane reached its operational height, you might end up at a higher altitude than the top of Mount Everest, with temperatures below negative 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Between asphyxia, hypothermia, and frostbite, your short-term chances of survival are slim. Even still, there is also the risk of longer-term damage to the brain, kidneys, and other internal organs. None of which I had to worry about, thankfully. 
I braced myself against the walls of my small enclosure as the plane finally began to taxi out into the runway, locking my limbs in place as the plane gained in speed, and finally pulled away from the ground. There was a tense moment as the landing gear pulled itself up into the wheel well, the rear tires getting uncomfortably close before locking into place. The hatches finally closed behind them, cutting off the harsh wind, leaving me in darkness. My filter mask made a faint hum as the plane gained in altitude, as a small set of air pumps inside the mask that I hadn't noticed before began to pressurize the air passing through its filters. While that wouldn't help against the cold, at least I wouldn't have to worry about passing out from lack of oxygen anytime soon. I let out a resigned sigh within the dark and increasingly cold confines of the wheel well as I settled down for the first leg of my journey. I still had three more planes to sneak aboard after this, for a total of around 32 hours of flight time. This is going to suck. If you like this content, don't forget to like and subscribe. See you later, bye bye.